Reads my fellow free and love and thinkers. This is LL3's Rules Podcast. My name is Craig Trains, waiting for the beautiful swampy mangroves in South Florida. And today's date, Wednesday, June 20th, 2018. Looks like summer is cut just today. Or maybe next day, something like that. So, summer solstice. Interesting stuff may be happening. Of course, it claimed about a little amount of sacrifice occurring in Denver around every summer winter solstice. So called great elites will be um, will be involved. That's according to Stu Webb. Yeah, people say whatever they want. He's an interesting chap. Doesn't mean he's always wrong. A lot of stuff he has a great amount of merit too. I was uh, checking on some of the not the work that happened a couple of days ago on a gentleman named rap artist named Extination. I think I pronounced his name correctly. And he was uh, murdered in a uh, Pompano, alleged rob called, claimed to be a robbery. I have to be very frank, that particular part of the town is not really, it's pretty rough, I would say. It gets face very blighted, but it doesn't mean the folks there are bad, but you have a lot of mischief in that part of the town. It's a real shame because the person's like 20 years old, and uh, he has some rough edges, allegedly. A lot of it, he knows how, he can know how to push the envelope. Some of the songs I've heard, very, like a ballad, deep emotional. Even that one video, Moonlighting, which people find it very controversial, about a lynching of a white young boy being hanged in front of an audience. I remember I talked about this one time, and I seen the video in its entirety at that moment. And um, people, the whole message is, if it would have happened to someone during that time of history, when individuals were being lynched by a mob, a lot of towns were doing it, including areas in Florida, including Fort Lauderdale to be exact. No one would care. But if it's the other way around, they'll exploit it to the core. And the fine line, fine point of that video, he condemns all forms of death. Murder of children, people being lynched, regardless of what they look like. So I keep that in mind. When people find him offensive. So, and I know he lives, he lives from uh, South Florida, man, boy, too. So, young man, 20 years old. Dollar, dollar, come back. See. May make some waves, may have pushed the envelope. May be considered a threat. I can't really jump the gun on this, but there's some, there's some, there's sometimes you gotta question these incidences. Look what happened to Fox Shakur, for example. He got shot in Vegas. People, some people, oh, he got what he deserved, but when you start really looking to deep on his past and his interviews, he's not some dumb slug junkie drug addict duck or a piece of garbage. There's one particular individual who was trying to have the folks in those areas see the light. So that's one thing I always have to say. He is too young to pass. I'm trying not to exploit his legacy in vain either. He left a lot of people he made he made impact in that genre of music. I'm just, I'm just curious how deep does the rabbit hole go? It may so be further for me. Whatever you folks do out there, keep it real. Stay vigilant. Love one another. Look out for your neighbors as, as yourself. Then the community can rise properly. You're going to have evil and darkness, but it can't all be conquered or minimalized. All right. So uh, it is a shame. I have to say that on that. You think? I know a lot of people talk about it on the news. I take time to check it out. It's just an example of of what a dangerous world we live in. So I'm gonna continue on here, and I'm at uh, Squiggies.
New York style pizzeria located at 207 Hermesy Street. Hermesy Drive, which is Southwest Second South, Southwest Second Street in the heart of downtown Fort Lauderdale. Got Ron, Ronnie Baby, the best decision maker in Hermesy. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty uh, sunny and warm in Fort Lauderdale. So I'm going to, the whole big hoopla right now is talking about what's going on with the children and they all want to point the fingers, do the blame game. It's all the Trump administration's fault, but in reality it's been proven respectfully. It's been going on for quite a while before it became president. And you know, people don't know my show well enough. I'm, I could be very critical of Trump, but I'm not going to throw everything at him through this witch hunting fetish. That's a complete turnoff. That's for cowards and wussies. And I say that politely. No, I just got, it just, just came in, uh, just came in my email account. And this one's entitled, it's from rollcall.com. It's entitled, Trump will sign executive action ending family separation. Or will be some more preemptive, but ultimately match by the decision, he said. That is their job, is to uh, make sure they create laws for under uniform and naturalization acts and laws and all that. So, as it says here, happened at 12.34 p.m. today. President Donald Trump said he will sign executive action ending the practice of separating migrant children from their parents and then a fire from the soft congressional Republicans break with him. The President and the White House has been under intense pressure, including from Republican members, to end the separation practice that stems from the administration's policy to attempt to prosecute every adult nab trying to cross the U.S.-Mexico border illegally. We're going to be signing an executive order in a little while, he said in the cabinet room, during an unrelated meeting with lawmakers. We've got to keep families together. Trump was vague about what he intends to sign on migrant separation, described it as somewhat preemptive, but ultimately matched by the legislation, I'm sure. Earlier Wednesday, the president again blamed Democrats for the practice, but cryptically added this. I'm working on something. Two House officials were pressed on the matter, with both declining as described. A Fox News report about consideration of an executive order is an act, an order and as inaccurate. That's what he says about the tweet. It's a Democrat's fault they won't give us votes needed to pass good immigration legislation. We want open borders, which breeds horrible crime. Republicans want security, but I am working on something that never ends. As in this tweet, 9.41 a.m. White House officials also did not discount reports that the president would accept a standalone bill to end the separations. He had pressed members to include in a broader immigration overall mass measure. Executive border could halt the separation and by swift policy reversal by the president and his team. That's because Trump said his, er said his early Tuesday afternoon on the current law, we have only two policy options to respond to this massive crisis. We can either release illegal immigrant families and minors who show up at the border from Central America, or we can arrest the adults for the federal crime of illegal entry. So I'm asking. Congress to do is to give us the third option, which we have been requesting since last year. Legal authority to detain and promptly move families together as a unit, he said then. Senior House Republicans even on Wednesday mo morning echo echoed the President and his top Homeland Security officials in saying the charge to exist existing laws would be required to end the crisis. The Trump administration considered of an executive action came less than 24 hours of the president huddled with the House Republicans and expressed both moral and political concerns of the separation program he green-lighted in April. Since then, more than 2,000 children have been removed from their parents, care while the adults await prosecution for the misdemeanor of trying to enter the United States illegally. At least it's being nice, a misdemeanor. I know, I came in, I Some places, they're a lot more brutal. Earlier t Tuesday, both on Twitter and during remarks at a small business conference in Washington, the public defense, the president defense the policy. Republican members emerged from their meeting with the adult and said he had prefaced his call for them to address the separation matter by describing it as a fix as the right thing to do. 
nor the president is aware of public perception. Members who are not shocked. He also warned them to injure the children, wearing them as their parents, and taking away and the infants and toddlers in cages could lead office voters to punish GOP candidates in November. There's always a this partisan blame game. You know how this thing goes. When you uh, really look at it, I would say this I've said plenty of times, club over an agenda. Speaker Paul D. Ryan opened a GOP leadership news conference when they emphasized that House Republicans did not support the separation of children from the parents. He said the House would vote Thursday and a measure that would fix the issue at the board. Families will remain together under DGS, DHS custody to move the length of the proceedings. Ryan says noting the bills include funding the DHS, DHS can use provide housing for these families. So check this go on here. During this uh, powwow with House Republicans, Trump took no questions. Nor he did he mention several House and Senate bills have been on the road out on air in the works and could end separation practices, but he instructed lawmakers to act after the administration has said it has his hands are tied. George W. Bush and Barack Obama administration are subject to the same laws and rulings opted against splitting kids from parents. Hardliners and the Trump administration chose to reverse that practice in April. Republicans and Democrats have said in recent days that Trump has the authority to simply instruct federal law enforcement officials to stop separating mom, stop separating migrant families. President Trump could stop this policy with a phone call. GOP Senator Lindsey Graham, more monger Lindsey Graham, of South Carolina said during Friday's television interview, if you don't like families being separated, you can tell DHS stop doing it. Yeah, that's, that's a guy who loves um, to bomb every country in the world, right? <laughs> There's a little bit of a double standing game for a lot of these folks. But it's been going on for, for a period of time. They all want to point the finger. Like I said before, I critical certain people, but I make sure I go by their actions and that's it. They all want to do is point, 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 point. They don't want to look in the mirror. Well, and even in my past articles I've, I've read, past articles I've read, talked about many of them too. Are being not being with their parents. That is wow. So we all got to see how deep this rabbit hole go, and we have to really look at what the documentation would say on this quote order. And um, one thing I told folks too about what's going on down in those areas: the, the war on drugs, the U.S. meddling with foreign policy. Something got past practice. The United States has been meddling with other countries' affairs. That has happened too. So it's called blowback. Can this be part of it? Absolutely. But that I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it. So I want to do I'm gonna add a, a video to this by Ron Paul talking about the border crisis. And uh, it'll be a YouTube one. It's all about the children or hate or hatred for Trump. So like we told everybody, you can be critical. But have merit and don't be a parent. Well, Speaking of government, this came from the Freedoms article. Get a dose of the truth. It's entitled China's Technological System to Control Dissenters. How willing is that? Saying, uh, Sesame Credit is all the encompassing technological and authoritarian system, now used by China to control its system. China has emerged as a new world order model for decades, although these there is a superficial facing off between the U.S.-led West on one side and China and Russia on the other. The New World Order plan is to use the friction to create in these geopolitical battles to merge all nations of a world under a one world government. That's right, divide and conquer. Many NWO controllers have long displayed open administration for the Chinese model of authoritarianism, centralized power, and the large amount of control it wields over its massive population. Recently, China introduced a massive society-wide system called Sahima Credit, or Sesame Credit, a full-spectrum social credit system that assigns the score to citizens and based how good they are. This system is based on gamification, i.e. the gamifying of virtually every human endeavor itself based on the exploitation of brain chemistry, dopamine hits, and uh, human psychology. However, it's not just a harmless game. It can have serious real-world consequences. Chinese journalist Liu Hu felt the burnt 
of the Chinese NWO model when he was denied the ability to buy property, take out a loan, buy an airplane ticket, or even travel to on a Chinese train. Yes, so all you folks out there think it's that such a great country. Head over there. <laughs> Just me credit denying the senators their rights to financially so transact. For stars, we are told by by none less than the Chinese Supreme Court itself that the underlying philosophy of the Supreme Court is once untrustworthy, always restricted. And now that's a chilling any human philosophy that there ever was one. Imagine if the same principle was applied in the reverse by citizens toward their government. What government on earth would survive? What authority would have a sufficient level of corruption be found untrustworthy in some way? Imagine if we live in a world where people could simply apply this to the governments and instantaneously restrict them. That's a great that's a great point. In the US there's a whole system of credit reports and credit scores that allow banks and leaders to rank borrowers based on how credit worthy they are. This had a consequence for taking out loans for houses, cars and other reasons, as well as for attaining credit cards. However, the system is based purely on your financial history, activity, and level of responsibility. I said Sesame Credit, take the idea in a whole new level. The algorithm generate a score, not just based on your financial history, but numerous other outputs, such as your criminal record when you, whatever you pay your taxes, fines, and fees, how well you obey traffic rules and other laws, your shopping, and your lifestyle habits, and here's the big one, how well you support the government. For the Chinese, the Sesame Credit is now starting to rule their lives. It determines their access to loans, housing, social services, certain types of employment, travel, university, and information, internet. It is influencing and determining all sorts of behavior. I'm sorry about that. So it's behavior even who people choose to be friends since their Sesame Credit score become lower or higher depending upon the scores of their friends. Clearly, there's a far-reaching, dangerous kind of technological social engineering, which reduces the value of the human being to be a, to a number and essentially forces them to respect authority in order to maintain their standard of living. And a lot of stuff about China watching right here. You can really see this for yourselves. Very interesting indeed. Oh, very Aurelian. <coughs> Limiting the personal power of the dissidents. A few brave Chinese have found the hard way what can happen if you rock the boat. According to, the, to, the, to this Globe and, and Mail article, accomplished journalist Lei Hu spent 20 years pushing back against censorship in China. He used his blog to expose corruption of the high level officials. In 2013, he was accused and arrested for crimes such as fabricating spreading rumors. In 2016, in a separate case, found him guilty of defamation. So, Huh. Sorry about that. Then in 2017, Lou felt impact on getting the wrong side of authorities in modern day China. He discovered that his life has abruptly changed without any notice. He had been caught up in early weeks of social credit system that China is developing as a pervasive tool for social control. One expect to one day tighten the state's grip on the citizens. Chris have called it in a willing creation, a new kind, a new kind of thought police. Well, what it meant for Mr. Lowe is that when he tried to buy a plane ticket, booking system refused his purchase, saying he was not qualified. Other restrictions soon become apparent. He has been barred from buying property, taking out a loan, or traveling on the country top tier trains. There is no file, no police warrants, no official advance notification. They just cut me off from things I was once entitled to, he said. What's really scary, there is nothing you can do about it. You can report it to no one. You are stuck in the middle of nowhere. The article published in January this year, 2018, states that the blacklist has swelled to 7.49 mil million names of last summer, June in August 2017, presumably. The Globe and Mail also examined the records of two dozen people on the blacklist, many of whom had committed major minor offenses. One man was blacklisted over a $1,500 rent payment, 
Another has not been paid $1,900. Another failed to pay $195 fine. Yet another has shoplifted 10 packs of cigarettes worth $70. China dreamed the NWO motto of the globals. The dream. The NWO globals have declared an obvious administration for China. The now deceased Dave Rockefeller wrote this in the New York Times in 1973, only around a decade after Mao Zedong's disastrous Great Leap Forward, which took the lives of an, esti of an estimated 8 to 55 million people. Whenever the price of the Chinese Revolution they had obviously succeeded, not only producing more efficient and dedicated administration, but also also in fostering a higher morale and community purpose. Social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in human history. To give Western readers an idea of just how authoritarian China has become, consider this, a lawyer named Li Zaolian discovered he couldn't buy a plane ticket because of, of, uh, of, uh, of a sincere apology. Yes, you read that right. Insincere apology. The, the Chinese government has not only has the power to order someone to apologize, but also to determine whether the apology is sincere. Eerily resumizient of the party's purpose in 1984 to ensure all citizens not only obey their brother, but love, love their brother. This incident had nothing to do with the Sesame credit per se. However, the instance of apology meant he failed to comply with the court order which signed to him on a government blacklist. So if you offend them, it will it will condemn you. Of course, no knives and forks, quick little aside here. Gamify you. China is a big player in the technological and IT field, the Sesame Credit system is being fueled by technological advances to grab data from all aspects of citizens' existence. Commercial, social, emotional, political, and moral, moral, and distill this data into a single score, which becomes the basis of the hierarchical or tiered society. Tiered society. However, in the comparison to the historical ca caste, caste system of India, where you were born to a particular class and stuck there for life, Sesame Credit encourages you to actively change your behavior via gamification. To become more compliant, self-censoring, obedient, and deferential, all in the hope of getting a better score. In this way, Sesame Credit is even more insidious than the caste system. Caste system. It's no wonder that control freaks would love to roll out such a system worldwide under the auspices of a global government. In conclusion. It's no exaggeration to label Sesame Credit as the most ambitious attempt by any government in modern history to control the citizenry via technology, psychology, and gamification. It is indeed a new kind of authoritarianism that minds a person's online identity, combines it with their offline identity, and assesses them based on anything they've ever seen, wrote, or, or done. From a pop culture perspective, is it similar to the Netflix series Black Mirror, where a virtual digital score is attached to everyone in society? Wow, as I say, God bless Big Brother, right? If we're if we're not if we're not aware that this exact kind of system will be rolled out in the Western nations and, and everywhere at a current state of consciousness, it would be it would not be surprising if, if many sleepwalking people lost sight of the aim of the latest project of getting a high score. Forgetting how the whole point is to gamify, gamify them and mold them to exactly the kind of docile citizens the state want. That's the train. Want in, so, interesting stuff by, uh, this stuff by Mik Mikia Freeman. That was, um, uh, there's plenty of other sources to look this up as well. And like I said, it's, um, I remember Eric I mean, uh, Kissinger talked about China, or David Rockefeller, and of course the banksters too, Henry Kissinger and Rothschilds are holding hands with them too. Like I said, my friends, divide and rule. So when they say they want to go after China, think of the New World Order instead, because they want to do it to everybody. This is how these vampires think. One of the areas. 
we can do. See, one thing about these little um, Sesame Credit, every type, every high-tech gadget has a floor. What's going to happen? The smartest people in there, the high-tech, the hackers in China, will figure out how to counter it. And that will drive the Chinese government crazy. They're able to they're all good little boys and girls, but they can become maverick. Mark my words on that. One of the areas you gotta make sure don't if you see something like that <coughs> being brought out, stand up against it because they wanna make your natural born rights into a privilege. Cool. So I'll be back. So stay tuned. Alright, so next one we can be discussing is Jesse here. Came from John Rockport's blog. It says here, is this the century of uh, secession? And it came out today as well. Here is the political question of our time. What will be one future for all or many future side by side? Read on. Any movement towards secession is a good thing, no matter how well ill conceived. It puts a different idea in mind, detect, decentralized, opt out, strive to make become more self sufficient. This idea can spawn many new strategies over the long run. For example, there's a lot of big, a lot of noise about California to see it from the union. One plan would split the state up into three parts. This is currently the strongest initiative because those three parts won't, wouldn't actually succeed, they would become new states. However, Congress is okay for the formation of new states and will, and will it never do so. All interesting and foretold chaos obscures something else that's happened in California. The Mercury News reported it's on April 14th of this year, at least 14 Southern California cities and two counties have passed ordinances and in some cases filed lawsuits against the state's controversial sanctuary laws that largely prohibit local and state authorities from cooperating with federal immigration officers who won't want to deport illegal immigrants. While the, the anti-sanctuary uh, wave is rolling across some of California's most Republican strongholds, Orange County, Orange and San Diego counties, they aren't an aftershock from the 2016 election. Democrat Hillary Clinton, Clinton trounced Trump in Orange County by 8 percentage points and San Diego by 20 percentage points if you believe the legitimacy of the vote count. According to the Mercury News, here are local entities that have rebelled against California Sanctuary Immigration Policy, Orange County Board of Supervisors, San Diego County Board of Supervisors, Baymont, which is Riverside County, Dana Point, Orange County, Rapon, which is San Joaquin County, Joaquin County, Los Alamitos, Orange County. <coughs> Sorry about that. La, um, Laguna Miguel, Orange County, San Juan Caspertrano, Orange County, and Luzio Viejo. Orange County, Mission Viejo, Orange County, Bur Yobra Linda, Orange County, Nor Norport Beach, Orange County, Westminster, Orange County, Huntington Beach, Orange County, Orange, Orange County, Fountain Valley, Orange County, and, and Condadillo, San Diego County. This is where the action is. The moment, this moment has legs, it could spread even further. For example, those, these, suppose these rebellion communities get together. For both a few leaders have working imagination. Who knows what they might come up with? Suppose a few communities in, in California decide that they don't like the state's mandatory child vaccine laws and they want to refuse refuse this provision. One idea, even an overworkable one, give birth to other ideas. A cocktailian begin. A cocktailian begin. For example, people consider the. You know, original notion of limited government in the Constitutional Republic. Unconscionable Unco government uh, meddlers are seen as meddlers and criminals and a way build. People experiment, experience glimpses of freedom. They hunger for more. They feel something new stirring in their bones. They, they contemplate the possibility that dooms is not inviolable. What would, what would 1776 look like and what might be played out in this today in the state of California that once celebrated cutting edge innovation before an elite funding infection rolled on, rolled in. The best estimate of the 13 counties, the population of 1776 is 2.5 million. The Federal Republic was designed for a small group, not, not 325 people. Jefferson envisioned a lot of independent republics, 
from village to rural county to state to federal, each emphasizing freedom of the individual, each hamstring power of the government to strictest degree people. All right, sorry about that. It says here he was not he was not alone. The whole freedom movement of the time was conscious of the danger of unchecked government and corporate control. If fell the state legislators to limit corporations by chartering them to do business, if a corporation harmed the public good, the legislature could without trial exile it from the state. This was the line with the prevailing concept, eventually overturned by corrupt judges and business monopolists that a corporation is not a person and it did not have rights of an individual. In any effort in the direction of decentralization is a good thing. We are long overdue in that regard. As far as Europe is concerned, the country who, who birthed the idea of individual freedom after centuries of struggle, from whom the American founders took their political innovations, their, pre their present European Union is a lurching monster. It is a direct contradiction to the profound concept of liberty that should be repealed on every front of the sum, uh, similarly dumped and left outside of, on, of the road. A world of fascism that once posed as a purveyor of the public good. Decentralization really becomes fascinating when you consider the formation of international communities based on political ideas of every stripe. The inhabitants themselves decide the principles that apply. Some version of share and care and equality for all, a constitutional republic, a monarchy, experiments proliferate and stand and fall on their own. With the advance of technology, it's, poss it's possible to outfit a local community with its own power supply, with its own digital platforms, etc. On behalf of increased self-sufficiency, the octop octopoid reach of overweening central governments loses strength. New cultures evolve side by side, whatever the shape of the political structures of communities take. The underlying, underlying effort is pro-independent. This would be an authentic secession. The vector move to moves towards the individual and away from the collective. On the education front, that's already happening, as parents discussed, with the crime, drugs, social indoctrination, and political correctness in public brainwashing centers are opting for homeschooling. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know the so-called health freedom movement has been expanding for many decades. It's based on the concept that every person has the right to manage his own health and seek out unconventional treatments. Despite government efforts to corral the population to big pharma medicine, citizens have broken out of that mold in a big way. Then there is alternative news. Untold numbers of decentralized outlets have bloomed across the world. Of course, they're labeled fake news because the mainstream monopolists are terrified if they're losing grip on the minds of the population. In 2001, when I launched my site, nomorefakenews.com, I was acutely aware of mainstream brainwashing the arena of information. I defected from print journalism and went out on my own. 17, year late, 17 years later, I'm still here. Decentralization on every front is occurring. It isn't always pretty, and it isn't always on target. But that's what you get when you, you that's what you get when you get freedom. Light pushes through worn ground and explores new possibilities. It all it all comes back to the individual mind. And that mind free and wide ranging or is it programmed? When free minds cooperate, the choices are extensive and success is possible in many directions. Decentralization is all about imagination. That is the key. When individuals can see the futures they want. By Im imagining and projecting them, doors and windows into the future open, not, no, not one future for all, but many futures side by side. One future for all, this is a totalitarian nightmare, a globalist nightmare. The cracking that Molinist is the job of this century. And he is absolutely correct. And I see this a lot too. Even like we ever talk about the whole thing on... Um, net neutrality, they want the FCC involved and all that, and, and, and others are starting doing their own community websites, community internets, and that's incredible, so stuff is occurring, so you can't just rely on one area, because that's totally absurd, and, and, they, and I'm really pleased about people talking about secession, not just the United parts of the United States, or Cal it's a California, for example, but the world, look what happened to Catalonia, okay, when they seek their independence, and what's interesting about that, a lot of people don't even understand why those southern states one of the reasons why the southern states has to cede it from, from 
the federal government of the United States of America wasn't well, I mean it's still the slavery. Some politically they had some issues, but the bigger picture was the um, was taxes, the tariffs, and all that. They're written like you know the southern states, like North South Carolina, for example, getting paid eight percent tariffs. So they're getting screwed big time, and the other and the northern states at the time were getting were getting as a pat in the head. So that's just an example. Same thing happened to Catalonia with Barcelona. They're, they're like they're like they have, had the healthiest economy in Spain, and they're paying the whole lump sum. So that's one of the reasons why they want to do separation at that time. You, can you blame them? No, you're gonna call them racist, bigots, and all that. Absolutely not. So, so um, secession is good. It keeps it keeps those hot shots on their toes and liberates humanity and free thought. And so that's one thing I do see this happening, not just in the United States, but around the world. And like what happened at Brexit, for an example. Okay, when the voters, uh, like the voters, um, said get out of uh, the European Union, and of course uh, some places, you know, the majority didn't want it. But you know what? The message has been sent, and now they they, they try not to try not they try not to try to hear this fear factor about Brexit's bad. You need the European Union. It's a whole this whole thing is all a Wellian European Union propaganda at its finest, Club of Rome, to be exact. So. That's what they want. They want to destroy individualism, culturalism, and heritage. Well, we can all give the big middle fingers and no, you don't own me. We think for ourselves. This is why the century, is this a century of secession? Absolutely. And endurance as well. But, um, ooh. Got that one hip hop, hip hop. KRS1 said. On um, the Obama deception, even though it's Infowars, but it was it was very good. He said, "Year of the century of endurance." So keep it up, my friend. Stay vigilant. Don't let the propaganda web of fear control maintain you, because then you'd be dumb, stagnant, and happy. You don't want to be like the Sesame Credit program, okay, from China. I think the people in China, I, I like them to see. I want to see them succeed and separate. Tibet will be a perfect example. To get the ball rolling over there. Don't be surprised if that's in the works. Okay, so finally, I'm going to do one more thing here. This came from the Future of Freedom Foundation, FFF.org. It says here, the pro media deserves criticism, not sainthood, by James Robert. The media nowadays are busy con- con- congratulating themselves for their vigorous criticism of Donald Trump. To exploit that surge of sanctimony. Hollywood producer disputed Steven Spielberg rushed out the post, a movie depicting an epic press battle with the Nixon administration. Critics raved over the film. What the New York Post news last week labeled journalism porn of the highest order. But Boston Public Radio Station WBUR calls it the most fun you ever have at a civics lesson. Spielberg County has moved to claim that a free press is a crusader for truth, but in the media hoopla around the post is acting to geezers boasting of having shown mo- uh, moments of courage when they were almost 50 years younger. The post is built around the Pentagon Papers, a secret study begun in 1967 analyzing where the Vietnam War had gone ar- ari. The 700-7,000 700, 700, page Tommy showed that the presidents and military leaders have been proudly deceiving the American people ever since the Truman administration and the mis- same mistakes were being endlessly repeated. Like many policy aut- autopsies, the report was classified as a secret and completely ignored by the White House and federal agencies, which most needed to heed its lessons. The New York Times editor Tom Rickard com- commented in 1971 that the people who read these documents at the time were the first to study them. Daniel Ellsberg, a former Pentagon official, heroically risked life in prison to smuggle the report to the media after members of the Congress were too cowardly to touch it. The New York Times shattered the political sound barrier when it began courageously publishing the report despite a profusion of threats to the Nixon administration justice Justice Department. As the federal court slapped the Times with an injunction, the the Washington Post and other newspapers published additional classified excerpts from the report. The Post ignored the fact that the U.S. government policy in Vietnam did not become more honest after the Pentagon Papers' disclosure. In such time, the government's notion of repenting is merely to substitute a new and more ludicrous falsehood. 
Besides, as retired State Department whistleblower Peter Van Buren noted, the, the Post has no real interest in the Pentagon Papers except as a pop plot device, almost an excuse needed to make this movie. Because the uh, Washington Post had a female publisher, Spielberg made it rather than the Times, the star of the show, Van Bergen suggested Spielberg might as well have costume Meryl Steep, no Street, who played the Post publisher, Catherine Graham, in a pink pussy hat for the boredom scenes. Boardroom scenes. The movie failed to mention Graham's cozy relationship with President Lyndon Johnson. A few weeks after the John F. Kennedy assassination, a secret tape made by the Johnson White House captured Johnson and Graham, whom he called Sweetheart, flirting up a storm during a phone call. She later flew, flew to his Texas ranch for a personal visit. Spielberg's movie post editor Ben Bradley denouncing the silence government officials to Graham the, w the way they lied those days have to be over. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, who deluged the, the media with falsehoods about battle, battlefront progress, did more than anyone else, except perhaps Lyndon Johnson, who vastly increased the bloodbath for Americans and Vietnamese. McNamara's disastrous decease did not deter the Washington Post from appointing him to its board of directors. As Norman Solomon, author of War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, recently observed, the Washington Post was an instrumental in avidity promoting that lies that made the Vietnam War possible in the first place. Pentagon Papers proved that politicians and their tools were, were brazenly conned the American public to drive the nation to, into an unnecessary war, but the lessons vanished into the D.C. memory hole conveniently for bootlicking journalists such as Post Superstar Bob Woodward. The late Robert Perry, a Washington correspondent for Newsweek in the late 1980s, declared that he saw self-censorship because of the coziness of, between Post, Next Week, executives, and se uh, senior national security figures. The post-Vietnam coziness, perhaps the memory of winning the Pentagon on Papers, showdown with the feds helped make the media overconfident about the ability to resist temptation to become political tools. New York Times columnist Gloria Lewis Writing three weeks before the 9 11 attacks, comment on a review of the book on the U.S. government lies in the Vietnam War. There will possibly, probably never be a return to discretion, real, coll really collusion with the with which the media use to treat present. And it's just as well. Within months of her comment, the media had broken almost all prior co cow towing records. CNN chief Walter. CNN Chief Walter Isaacson explained, especially right after 9-11, there was a real sense that you didn't get that critical of a government, government that's leading us in wartime. In March, 20, uh, March 17, 20, 2003, George W. Bush justified invading Iraq by invoking UN resolutions purporting to authorize the United States to use force in winning a rack of, a rack of weapons of mass destruction. A year later, he performed a skit at the radio of television correspondents' annual dinner featuring slides showing him crawling around the Oval, Oval Office, peeking behind curtains as he quipped, quipped to the pool by attendees. Those weapons of mass destruction have got to be somewhere. Nope, no weapons here, over there, maybe under here. And the crowd loved it, all, loved it, and the poet's headline and his reports in the evening George Bush, entertainer-in-chief, Craig Mitchell, the editor of Post and Publisher, labeled the press's reaction that night as one of the most shameful episodes in the recent history of the American media presidency. And I, uh, you know, what's what I've seen that, um, I've seen that video clip, and I am not impressed. That's why people are laughing. That's how disgusting these, these scumbags are. They're nothing more than vampires and voivods, okay? And this is why I get really touchy when people want me to go and support these jerk-offs. Okay, even back then. Like, what was funny when people talk about the Patriot Act, you know, I, I, did, I did a song called God Bless the Patriot Act. It's doing it for our own good because the whole thing's nothing more than a wet dream and a monumental lie. So uh, that's how I see this. I remember, I remember that party. You know, I was not impressed. Most of the media... Have been um, had ambled 
themselves to the Iraq war for long before that agenda. The Post blocked and buried pre-war articles exposing the Bush team sham on Iraq. Their award-winning Pentagon correspondent Thomas Rick, uh, Ricks complained there was an attitude among editors, look, we're going to war and we don't even have to worry about all this contrary stuff. That's the question. Instead, before the war started, the Post ran 27 editorials in favor of an invasion and 140 front page articles supported the Bush administration's case for attacking Saddam. The New York Times printed a barrage of false claims of WMDs while asking articles by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter James Risen demolishing the administration's claims of a link between Iraq and Al Qaeda. The New York Times also refused to publish classified documents showing pervasive and legal national security spy on America's prior to the 2004 election, even though it received the proof of vast wrongdoing that the Times had not finished. George W. Bush might have been denied a second term. Broadcast media were even quicker to, to grovel for the war effort. PBS NewsHour host Jim Lier, Le, uh, Leher explained it would have been difficult to have de- had had debates about invading Iraq. Would have had to have gone against the grain. Leher neglected to say exactly how cow towing became patriotic. Uh, news and anchor news anchor Katie Corrick revealed in um, 2008 there was a pressure from the corporations who were who were who who own where we where we work from the government itself really co- uh, squash any kind of dissent or any kind of questioning of the Iraq War and now Syria despite world media media gullibility. Or worse, in helping the Bush administration to settle the Iraq war, the press showed scant skepticism about subsequent U.S. attacks aboard. The media behave at times as if the government lies are dangerous only when a president is a certified bad guy, like Richard Nixon or Donald Trump. Barack Obama's semi-sainthood minimized media criticism of his Syrian debacle, a civil war in which the United States initially armed one side, through rebels who largely turned out to be terrorists, and then switched sides to flip-flop resulted in far more dead Syrians. But Americans have received a few insight into the bulk of schizophrenia from the media. Historian Stephen Kinsner wrote in the Boston Globe, coverage of the Assyrian war will be remembered as one of the most shameful episodes in the history of the American press. Even in the Trump, Trump era, when the press is openly clashing with the president, bombing still provides a push-button presidential redemption. Trump, Trump violence hour, according to much other media, occurred in April 2017 when he attacked the Assad regime with 59 cruise missiles, raising hopes that the U.S. military would topple the Syrian government. Now I remember all the nice people, oh yeah, like they're like climaxing. You know, even people down here that are Trump supporters are climaxing on this. A very total hypocrisy to the core, man, you know? When Trump announced that he was sending more troops to Afghanistan, the Washington Post editorial hailed his principled realism. Regardless of the other futility of pet- perpetuating that quagmire, at a time when Trump is a saber rattling against Iran and North Korea, the media should be vigorously challenging official claims before the U.S. bomb began falling. Instead, much of the coverage of rising tensions with foreign countries, foreign regimes, could have been written by Pentagon flash. Richard Nixon's henchman, H.R. Handelman, warned that the Pentagon Papers might make people believe you can't trust the government, you can't believe what they say, and you can't rely on their judgment. And the implicity inf- um, infability of presence, which have been accepted a thing in America, is, ba- is, badly, is badly hurt by us. Unfortunately, much of the media continue to presume that presidents are inf- infallible as long as they are killing each enough foreigners. One of the s- starkest lessons of the Pentagon Papers was the politician and their henchmen will tell unlimited lies and ignore stark warnings that plunge the nation into fo- unnecessary foreign wars and forgot falsehoods almost guaranteed new political treachery. Politicians don't need to provide strong evidence as long as the media continue treating them as they were Delphic oracles. Truth delayed, truth delayed is truth diffused because there's no way to rescind bonds that have already detonated. Media um, tub thumpers were crestfallen when the post when the post struck out struck on Academy Award night. It was nominated for Best Picture in other categories, but that worked out well for history since it leaves a path more open for subsequent 
documentaries or movies that provide a little more honest exposure on how wars get started and pe- perpetuate. Future movies might even venture into the forbidden grounds ground of media dialectically regarding systematic violations of human rights. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, in his 1971 opinion on the New York Times, the right to publish the Pentagon Papers declare only a free and unrestrained press can effectively expose deception in government. Unfortunately, the media often chose to trumpet official lies instead of fighting them, permitting glorious tales from eight presidencies ago to absolve subsequent media, Caltoy would be as foolish as forgetting the lessons of the original Pentagon Papers. Worshiping the media is a is as foolish as worshiping politicians. Yep. Hugo Black was right on that one. Justice Black was absolutely correct. Like I said, my friends, we got we all to look at things in the bigger picture now. Decentralize yourself. Like you see right now on geopolitical platforms, not just in California, but around the world. Now you can see what's going on on social media sites. There would be there's multiple ones out there who are fantastic. Check them out. I'm on a good amount of them. And I, usually I announce them. Check them out because they're really good. And they're wigging out. That's why these people, these mainstream media are going after these alternative guys because they have the, those guys have the balls to put out the truth to the best of their ability than go around cow towing and bending over for the establishment. Apostles of Ignorance, a good friend of mine told me from uh, Cosmo Gyro, Sean Adams being back. And I love that. That's a great title. And one thing for sure, people are waking up. Things are happening, my friends. The tide is turning little by little. And the other side are worried shitely. And I say that out of homage. And that is it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share through social media networks. Oh. Sorry about that. If you have any questions, comments, or you can send us on want to check out, whatever you do, please address your correspondence with the court. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, Breaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network. Minds.com, FutureNet.club, iHeartRadio, or Patreon.com forward slash local luck. Three three eyes to keep you at Gab, yours.org, oneway.org, or buddieslist.ca. For Gab is Gab.ai, G-A-B.ai. In addition, you can email me at luckyluck number three at gmail.com or the encrypted one, especially with the ProTab mail account. That'd be better. Lucky luck number zero three at protonmail.com. All right, my friends, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. May your guardian spirits be with you.